This is the Workplace Podcast with your host, William Corliss, brought to you in association with Yellowwood, providers of executive coaching, corporate training and facilitation, your external learning and development partner. Each week, we focus on a different aspect of the workplace. We hear from guest speakers who are subject matter experts and are incredibly talented at what they do. These experts will give you a different perspective and insight to work life with the aim of empowering you to take a different path to success in all aspects of work life. These perspectives will include career and personal success, leadership, high performance teams and creating a better work life culture in your organization. Yellowwood, take a different path to success with your career, team and organization. Today's guest is Marjorie Ingle, the co-author of Sorry, 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 The Case for Good Apologies. She is also the author of Mamela Knows Best and the co-creator of the apology watchdog website, sorrywatch.com. Marjorie has been a columnist for both the Tablet Magazine and The Forward, as well as contributing writer for Glamour and Self. She is also a ghostwriter and long ago the senior writer at Sassy where she was also the book's editor. Marjorie is also a frequent contributor to the New York Times Book Review. Welcome to the Workplace Podcast. Joining me today is Marjorie Ingle, one of the authors of Sorry, 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 The Case for Good Apologies, along with her colleague, Susan McCarthy. Marjorie, welcome to the Workplace Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, William. I am really interested in this topic of apologies. I thought I was really good at apologies. And my wife says, I think you need to read that book again. Uh, and, and I remember my 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 own experiences of making an apology as a child to my mother. And uh, ma'am, I'm, I know you're listening in here. Um, and she would go, what were you sorry for? And I would just squirm. I go, oh, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Your mom was a good teacher. That's basically it. We don't have to read the book now. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the book in itself for our listeners is jam-packed with so many insights. I didn't know there was so much to an apology, a bad apology, different things going on. And then you have the bingo cards where people just get it wrong or what not to say. So we're going to explore all those practical insights, but so many different insights that you and your partner, uh, Susan McCarthy, your writing partner there, ye started a website called sorrywatch.com where you go, you go all these public apologies and you're going to go, hey, hold on here. Look, look what they're doing. So can you tell me a little bit about Sorry Watch? Sure. We started it. We were longtime friends, both of us journalists who love to research. And uh, uh, we both used to live in San Francisco. I moved to New York. We wanted to collaborate on something. We had both written articles about apology for different outlets and were surprised at how uh, how these, these stories had legs, as they say. People just kept wanting to talk about them. Apologies were clearly such a resonant topic with people. Um, and so we started doing Sorry Watch sort of, you know, we sort of tongue in cheek, we're calling it the Apology Watchdog website in 2012. And mostly in the beginning, we made fun of bad political apologies, corporate apologies, celebrity apologies. And then as Americans uh, in 2016, a certain someone was elected who made not apologizing part of his brand and really was pretty explicit about apologies being a sign of weakness. And then I think our goals with the website shifted a little bit and we started thinking harder about doing a book about good apologies are actually really hard because our brains aren't designed to do them. So we started writing more about research on apology and good and bad research on apology. And we started looking at the fact that good apologies also go viral and there is a real yearning for people being vulnerable and honest with each other and for people who are willing to take the risk of apologizing and for people who are willing to both accept apologies and to say, 
eh, that wasn't great. Like your mom, uh, let me tell you what I need for, for, from you for me to accept this apology. Um, and that's, we think, a really grown up way of being both in the workplace and, you know, in our personal relationships. I'm going to take that because in the intro, I mean, you talk about being grown up, you have a quote from James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. What a brilliant quote. Um, so and, and again, from your intro, then. You you stick you stay here yourself and Susan. Apologies are evidence of a society that cares about itself, a society that honors other people's experiences, thoughts, and feelings as precious. In tiny ways and large ones, apologies move us towards justice. That's so powerful. Thank you. Uh, it's also true. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was fun for us to be snarky. And gradually, perhaps as we got older and as the world seemed to change and as social, you know, in 2012, social media didn't quite have the iron grip on us that it does now. I think we just felt more and more strongly that we were interested in justice and reconciliation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, apologies are really an important part of that. Yeah. And, and then we, we'll discuss about bad apologies because... It's a double-edged sword because if you go out and say, listen, we're going to get ahead of this. We're going to do an apology like your celebrity or corporate and stuff like that. And then it's like pouring fuel on a, on a fire. Just, then it's a small issue then becomes a big issue because now you're like denying what happened or you're trying to manipulate people or whatever, isn't it? Totally true. I think another word that has entered the vernacular more now than in, in 2012 is gaslighting. And I think people really know when they get an apology that is deflecting, that doesn't take responsibility, that sort of in some way tells you what you think happened isn't really what happened. And uh, that, again, you know, uh, I, I know we'll get to it, but we have this six and a half point plan that we're very proud of yeah. for how to apologize well. And the thing that's good about it is that it works in the office. It works if you are a seven-year-old who has been, you know, uh, accused of chasing a classmate with a booger, is booger Irish? Well, I think we American? know what you're referring to. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and it works if you're a politician who, you know, broke COVID protocols and had giant parties in your garden. Um, if you apologize well, it's easy, but it's also hard. And, you know, even I have to tell myself, am I doing these six and a half things that I have to do? Um, because, yeah, we all know when we're being lied to and manipulated in an apology. Yeah. And, and I like what you say about that gaslighting piece. So we'll go back to that before we go through this wonderful formula that yourself and Susan co has come up with. So, for example, and this is what you have is wonderful in the book, you have the bad apology bingo card. So in, in some of the chapters, then you have that at the very end, which is brilliant. So, for example, I was caught off guard or people were hurt by my tweet or this is how not really reflective of me and how I wanted to come across. These are kind of the, <laughs> that's not who I oh, am, so, you know, and, and it's it's like, <laughs> you know, a PR person has written this to kind of let, let's frame it this way. Right. And you would think that they would know as professionals that at this point, we all know the exact same formula that they're using over and over again. So, yeah, the bad apology bingo cards. At first, I just started keeping them to amuse myself. And then I'm like, let's put them on the site and then let's put them in the book, which are those are all actual phrases that have been heard in apologies, both from regular people and from famous people that instantly when those phrases appear, you know, it's a bad apology. And this is another line from the book. So let's let's frame it now to a good apology. So when you receive a good apology, it can make you feel connected to the person who took the step of reaching out to you and risking rejection. It can make you feel seen. It can give you a small experience of justice. So a good apology can be it can actually strengthen a relationship. Yes, um, we occasionally do these sort of more lyrical posts on the site. And one was about the Japanese art of kintsugi, which is when pottery breaks and you repair it with these little lines of gold 
uh, mixed with uh, an adhesive. And the piece is beautiful in a different way. It's stronger than ever. And it doesn't pretend that it was never broken. Um, and that's what a good apology does. A good apology isn't papering things over. It's addressing something, dealing with it, and then, you know, another bad apology bingo phrase is let's move on. The person who did the bad thing does not get to say let's move on or let's look ahead or let's go forward. Um, but in reality, when the person who hears the apology feels good about it um, and the person who made the apology feel, knows that they did well and feels the weight lifted of a, of a good apology well done, you have this beautiful new creation with gold lines through it that's stronger than it was before yeah and that's a great analogy isn't it that, uh, that piece there and again when we talk about the different type of uh, apologize apologies then is, is 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 there times when you should apologize and you shouldn't apologize yeah it's it's actually um not that difficult <laughs> which is if you're not sorry, don't apologize. And we may be, you know, in conflict with all the crisis management people who say that. But when you're really not sorry, you will not apologize well. And the, a bad apology almost invariably makes things worse. Um, however, if you talk to a trusted friend about the situation and they say, mm, maybe you should be sorry, that might be something to process. Um, another problem with the PR people and, uh, again, in our fast, you know, social media driven culture is people want to move so fast to paper things over, to fix it, to um, let's move on. And there are researchers like Cynthia Franz, who's a professor at Oberlin in Ohio, who studies, she studies the timing of apologies. And often if both the apologizer and for lack of a better word, apologizee, sit with the thing for a little bit, which is so antithetical to our culture. When the apology comes, the person who wants to apologize makes a better apology and the person who receives the apology is more open to, um, you know, to, to being able to talk about it. You're not like just completely still sort of shaking internally with rage. Um, so yeah, um, it's, imp and it's always important in an apology that the person who was harmed feels heard, you know, it's off, it can be really difficult to let somebody say, to let somebody basically, you know, criticize you or yell at you, um, without saying, but you, and the, but you could be another conversation that you have later, but when you're in the penitent position, you got to just kind of listen and try to absorb, even though your, you know, reptilian brain is going, no. <laughs> yeah. And, and it reminds me then of a, a paper I read. So I, I trained to be a mediator oh. um, and and I, I, I also train people to be mediators as well through Mediation Foundation of Ireland. And this is a wonderful paper by a guy called Zartman. And it, it's called about, is the moment ripe? For an apology and that they talk about that ripeness and sometimes it can be too early can't it be for an apology because because the emotion could be too raw for people they're not able to fully process i don't even right. know why i'm fully angry at you yeah but then sometimes then you just have to let people then to be able to receive that apology but then here's the thing if you leave it too late there's a danger that so there's something to do with timing isn't there right right Th there is you know, I, I hate the phrase that PR people use, the magic hour, um, which is uh, because I don't think there is just one hour in which you have to act. And often their interpretation of a magic hour is too soon. Um, I would also say um, it is never too late because sometimes something kind of burns in you for years and years and years. Um, about I did this thing that I know was bad. And initially you were like, either you were younger and dumb or you were defensive about what you did. And now as a sort of more mature adult, you know that you 
owe someone an apology. Um, the nice thing about apologizing is that it lifts this weight. And oftentimes, so I recently had a college friend uh, who I hadn't spoken to in years reach out to me. Like literally this was within the last few months. And he wanted to apologize for something that happened when we were first year university students. And he had, he got mad. He threw a notebook at me um, because he wanted my, he wanted to borrow my notes the day before the exam. And I was like, I need them. And he just got super entitled and huffy about it. Um, and I had forgotten the incident. And it's been, uh, let's say, over 20 years. And he had never forgotten it. And for him to hear from me, dude, I did not even remember that you did that. Now I do that you tell me this. Um, but I really appreciate you reaching out and saying you're sorry and I forgive you. And that was really brave of you. you I mean, for all you knew, I was still seething about it. Um, so I don't think it's ever too late. I mean, if you've done something really terrible, you might want to talk to somebody who is like you trained in mediation or a friend who you know has really good people skills because particularly in incidences where there might have been you know, I, again, we're, this is we're talking about a friendship, not about work. But if there was alcohol involved, if there was really bad behavior, you do have to think about whether the person would want to hear from you um, and how to handle that. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. I was only speaking to my sons last night as we were, we were in bed uh, and I was I was reading books and different things like that. And then whatever we got onto the topic, we were talking about sometimes apologies. I think something happened on the street and they were playing last night. And um, and I says, you know, I once got an apology after 20 years. And I was in school and it was 20 years. And the guy said to me, uh, he, he approached me in a pub in a bar in Ireland. And I was having a beer and this guy come over and says, I wasn't kind to you, but I really liked the guy. And we had met several times. He says, it's always in the back of my mind. And he obviously got Dutch courage after a couple of pints. Go, goes to me and I says, you know what? I always knew you were a good guy and you still are. You just had a blip. And he, he thought that was the best thing. We hugged and stuff like that. It's such a sweet moment. It's so meaningful. We were talking about four reasons not to apologize. So we covered it. You don't mean it. It would hurt the, hurt the other person. So unconsciously. Um, the other person doesn't want to hear from you. And again, finally, then I don't think we touched on this is the other person is demanding too many apologies. Yes. Um, so let's let's do both of the, the last two about the um the person doesn't want to hear from you can often be um we've talked to a lot of people who have been through 12 step programs and recovery programs in general. And a lot of that, the emphasis on that is making amends to people you've harmed. Um, sometimes people who are newly in recovery in particular are very eager to do the work as they say. And that's, you have to really think about whether you're seeking this apology is really more about you than it is about making amends. And if you haven't really, thought about how your apology will be received, you better sit with that for a while. Because if somebody doesn't want to hear from you, you have to sit with that. Um, and in terms of somebody demanding too many apologies, um, this is, I, I think this is often a problem in relation, in, in friendships and in marriages, that uh, there's a pattern to fights which is one person gets really upset and the other person ends up apologizing, 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 apologizing. The actual dynamic never changes. Um, but uh, one of our big influences is a, a psychologist named Harriet Lerner, who um, does a lot of couples therapy. And she has talked about when a partner cheats in a marriage and every fight at in the future, after they reconcile, 
winds up with, but you cheated. Um, that is not how you, that's not a fair fight. Uh, so if somebody just wants you to apologize and apologize and apologize, um, that is an unfortunate dance that the two of you are in. And, um, I would say that might be time to reevaluate that relationship because you don't have to keep apologizing over and over and over and over. Yeah. It's used as power, isn't it? Really? Yes. Well said the mediator yeah. of you there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, so our audience have been waiting all this time to go well actually what what is the formula what is the six and a half steps what is this magic you're withholding oh william i'm so glad you asked number one say you're sorry seems easy but not i would like to apologize not i regret say you're sorry or i apologize number two say what you did not the situation that happened, not, I don't know what it was you said to your mom, but like, you know, say the thing. What are you sorry for? I did not go to mass. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I cannot imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. I really can't imagine. Yeah, I'm kind of glad I did. No, I'm not really sorry. But anyways, there we go. <laughs> uh, number three, show that you understand why what you did was hurtful. Um, don't make it about you. Uh, do I am I feel so terrible? No, it's not about you. Number four is this is the hardest one. This is the one that trips me up every time. You can offer an explanation if it's necessary, but do not make excuses. Um, an explanation is um, the fact that uh, you wanted, you know, the bus didn't come. An excuse is. You know, the it was just not really that good an invitation that you sent and blah, blah, blah. Uh, number five, make it clear why what you did will not happen again. What steps are you taking to ensure that the problem doesn't recur? Um, that's often one that's missing in uh, politician, workplace, celebrity apologies. Number six, if it's possible, make reparations, pay for the dry cleaning, have everyone go through the DE, uh, do you say DEI there? Diversity, equity, inclusion? Yeah. Cleaning. Um, and the half step, which is another one that can be really difficult, listen. Um, and again, the if the other person wants to say something, you got to listen to it. That is part of the process. Um, and again, this is something that works if you're a child. You can teach a kid to do this. This is important. Like, think if Boris Johnson had done this, you know, with it, it you can't because it, there's just no way. But um, at this process works for everyone. And when, you know, in America, where we have such a litigious culture, um, you know, you have hospital systems saying you can apologize for a medical problem, but never take responsibility for it. That makes people vindictive. And it becomes this horrible, vicious cycle where people say don't apologize because then people are vengeful. But there are medical systems now that are starting to say, wait, a good apology makes people not vengeful. A good apology makes people feel like their pain had meaning, makes them feel like uh, you've explained to them why what happened will not happen to another family. Um, there is something good to be gained from something bad. I think that's a really important point because I had a similar episode with a hospital myself, oh, uh, no. you know, and, and, and I got half an apology and I thought because the intent was there, I didn't do it, but the way I had framed my uh, request was done in a positive intent, you know, and I think they were trying to protect themselves and I understood that. So I, I kind of was, but I could see how people could get very vindictive. And and then that brings me to mind then of there's different ways and mechanisms to send apologies or ever we'll talk about that. But what I want to do is, is, is talk about the zombies test. What's the zombies What's the zombies test? Because people are kind of going, listen, we're after getting six and a half steps there. There couldn't be much more to the book. And I can guarantee our listeners here, uh, and I'm going to go through um, this this here. There is nine chapters here. And we've, we've only touched on the surface of these. Okay. So again, here, here. So let's go back to that. The zombies test. What's, what's the zombies test? 
I love the zombies. The zombies is from Rebecca Johnson, who is a professor professor at the United States Marine Corps. And she was trying to teach her students about passive voice. And she's taught them that if you can put the word by zombies at the end of a sentence, that's using the passive voice. And what we have taken from this is if you can put the word by zombies at the end of a sentence, at the end of an apology, you have made a crappy, lousy apology. So let's say, I'm sorry uh, the book was dropped on your foot by zombies. So uh, I'm sorry the party was held during COVID by zombies. No, taking ownership is key to a good responsibility. And if you don't say I did the thing, which is active, not passive yeah. voice, you have not apologized well. And you might as well be a zombie. Because a poor apology might be, <laughs> I'm sorry that your feelings were hurt. Right. By zombies? Exactly. So, so if we were to frame that in a way of that, I am sorry, my actions hurt your feelings. Would that be the active way? Exactly. That is the active way. And even better than my actions would, would be for you to say specifically what mm. you did. Because um, I there's a there was a funny bit that Susan wrote about a, a dinner party gone wrong in the book, um, and it's not maybe the person isn't upset that you know you called their sister uh, a slutty hoe bag. Maybe the person is upset just that you threw the chutney. So make sure that you understand what the apology should be for from their perspective. And if you say you know I'm sorry about what I did, you want to make sure that. You're apologizing for the thing that they're actually upset about, yeah, about what you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I laughed out loud when I heard uh, the example you used in your book. I'm sorry I called your kid an ugly psychopath. Uh, I think, it was, it was. am I right in saying that? <laughs> yep, that's correct. <laughs> okay, so. We felt like we had to be funny a lot of the time because this is such a loaded topic and the book is so crammed with you know, research, but we really, and, and apologies just terrify people. So we wanted to be, make sure that this was funny and approachable and actually news you could use, you know? And, and, and this then brings me to the, what what's the right mechanism to use? So we're talking about a handwritten letter, email, text, face-to-face. -face. How, how should I do it? Like, you know, is, is there one way better than the other? Right. Again, again, this is a question of think about what the recipient would want. So a lot of times uh, you never want somebody to be trapped with you while you're apologizing. So we don't apologize in a car on a way to the meeting. Then the person would have to, you know, open the door and tuck and roll to get away from you. Um, you don't apologize. I once had a colleague uh, you know, I worked in a cube farm and the person stood in my corner of the cubes and blocked the exit to apologize. And I was just, you know, I practically had to like dive under his legs and I ended up, I literally ran to the women's bathroom because that was the only place I could go to get away from him ostentatiously apologizing to me when I did not want the apology at that time. Uh, so a text is good if it's not a huge deal. Um, face to face is good if the other person, if you are confident that the person would be okay with being face to face with you. Again, this is one where uh, somebody reached out to us to ask about um, a situation where the person had felt accused of racism and really, really wanted to explain themselves. Explaining yourself isn't quite an apology, and that is not a time when you want a human being to have to be in a position to listen to you. Um, email is good for something slightly more serious. And there is something really precious about getting a handwritten letter on nice stationery with a stamp, because God knows we don't get those in the mail anymore. And you know, somebody was being really thoughtful when they sent you a letter, when they went and they found where they keep the stamps, who knows where we keep the stamps anymore. Um, so I have a couple of written apology letters that I truly cherish. I have, I have a letter from uh, a former boyfriend who we broke up badly and I didn't hear from him for years. And I got a letter out of the blue with no return address saying, uh, Hey, I was thinking of you because 
Um, I'm getting married. I wanted you to know that I'm really sorry that I know that I was a bad boyfriend in many ways to you. And you thought I wasn't listening, but I was. And what we learned, what I learned from when we were together, I think is going to make me a better husband. And I was not only was I think that uh, that was an amazing gesture on his part. There was no return address. There was no expectation that I respond to him. Um, I could have ignored it if I'd wanted. Um, but it made me reevaluate the whole relationship. I felt like an idiot for being with this guy for so many years. And it changed the way I reflected on how we had been together. Wow. That's powerful, isn't it? It really is. It's a hugely undervalued, apology is a hugely undervalued tool in how we get along with each other. So what are things then not to say? If there are things like I'm listening in, I'm a listener and we go through certain things here where, um, did you, do you call them perf perfutos? What am I pronouncing that? Uh, per oh, we call it perfutos. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay. No, you're, we're, we're from different countries, sir. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I get things wrong from time to time. I'm okay. It's okay to do that. <laughs> So, so here are things to say. So I know you have a bingo card as well. It's it's like, I'm the victim here, or they never let me forget, or don't get mad at me. Get, you know, it's, it's that, what are the things that we, we do avoid yeah. saying? Um, the word, obviously, uh, you know, you well actually early, earlier, you know, the well actually is like a very, pompous sounding you know don't well actually in an apology don't use words like obviously which is if it was obvious you wouldn't have done it you know um don't say regrettable uh, a lot of times in uh corporate and celebrity apologies you hear um well i've already apologized to the word already just don't you know uh it, the implication is always have i not repented enough? Have I not worn this hair shirt long enough? No. Um, uh, you know, anytime somebody talks about, and this may be more of an American thing than an Irish thing, when anybody gets into this new age, you know, I'm on a journey, um, you know, none of us are perfect. I am learning to be my truest self. Uh, let's be honest, we want to punch that person in the face. <laughs> Uh, you know, a context, your apology is not when you offer the context. Um, unfortunate is a word that shirks responsibility. There are lots of things that you have to be, you know, I, I, I'm making it sound like it's this minefield and it really isn't, you know, sit down, maybe practice on a friend or on your cat, write yourself a note um, and just think about what, um, what would the person listening to me want to hear? Because if you just put that front and center, you'll be apolog you'll apologize fine. And that's what I like about the book. It really is like a handbook or a manual to get. Listen, we can navigate this. Every situation is different. Here are some tips. Here are things to avoid. Here are things definitely to do, like your your formula. Then, um, and then I'd like you to to discuss then what are poisoned apologies. Well, ap apologizing, but I really kind of like getting a dig in there so a poison apology is like when you get a beautiful piece of chocolate enrobed around a tiny knob of arsenic uh so a poisoned apology is an apology that says you know i am so sorry that i forgot that you really aren't used to how the workplace functions and that you have always led a really sheltered and protective life. Um, and um, I really regret that I didn't think about how you maybe don't have the same sense of humor as everyone else in the office. Um, you know, those are all ways of being extremely Extraordinarily toxic and really targeted in your hurtfulness when you're apologizing to someone. Yeah, it isn't. It, yeah, no, it, <laughs> it, it's. I think it's, it's it's fascinating. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out 
mfi.ie. And, and then, you know, when you talk about the, the bingo card, you know, that you have that, what are the different words then that we should be mindful of, of, of it's formulaic or it's like, oh, I need to avoid it. Is there anything else or our listeners should know? Um, things that are formulaic, um, you know, you have the, you know, we're all used to the Instagram apology that, um, always starts with, you know, Hey guys, I just wanted to come on here. Oh, you, your, your listeners can't see that I'm flipping my hair as I'm doing this. I just wanted to come on here. I'm holding my cute dog. And I just wanted to say, like, there's been a lot of negativity about, you know, some stuff that's happened. And like, I just want to be real with you guys. Um, We all know that deflective, uh, you know, it's been funny right now. um, I'm a big fan of Lizzo, um, the singer, and she is embroiled embroiled right now. Uh, You know, everybody has been waiting and waiting and waiting. And I saw this morning, my time that was finally, you know, so the incident was, that she, who has always been this um, icon of body positivity and embracing warmth and, you know, accepting people of all genders and sexualities and sizes and races, um, was, abs- you know, she was horrible to her backup dancers. And I saw that there was a statement today and people, you know, the PR people were like, it's taking too long, it's taking too long. But her response was fully, no apology. This is all lies. And you know what? I kind of got to respect the, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. But uh, I would rather have no apology than a half-assed apology. Yeah. And this is what you have then is before you apologize, check. Am I shifting the blame? Am I minimizing my offense? Am I sounding defensive? Do I really want to apologize here? And can I apologize without reminding the other person that they've sinned too? Yes. Yes. That's the, that is the hardest part is the, but I had to, because you, um, that conversation can happen, but it can't happen now. Mm. It doesn't go in your apology. Um, it is definitely, and again, with you, with a background in mediation, it's so worth discussing the patterns we get into as a culture as a couple, as a workplace, um, but those don't belong in the apology. Excellent, excellent for our listeners. And and then I'd like to move then to the science part of it. What prevents us from apologizing? So this is something we have really changed. The more we have looked at, we being Susan and I, um, the more we looked at the science behind good apologies and bad apologies. And really there's more research on forgiveness than there is on apology. But the more we looked at it, the more we realized how brave an act a good apology is because our brains are wired to make it hard. Um, We are wired to see ourselves as the hero of our own story. That's how we make it through the world. If we were constantly second guessing ourselves and constantly full of self-recriminations and, uh, you know, self-loathing, um, then we would never get anything done. We would just be curled up in a ball in our bedroom. Um, so for us to overcome our own brains, which, uh, which again, we, when we are faced with cognitive dissonance, like if we know I'm a good person, we all think we're a good person fundamentally. And if we are faced with evidence that we were not a good person, our brain will do backflips to reconcile that by saying, I really wasn't so bad at all. Really, the situation was not the way it first seemed. The other person did this and this, the extenuating circumstances were that. Um, for you to apologize, your, you know, your sophisticated, smart, kind self has to overcome that visceral, you know, fundamental, I'm good, I didn't do bad. Uh, So yeah, Um, so there's cognitive dissonance that uh, that we reconcile to our own favor. 
which is makes it difficult to apologize. There's the fact that a lot of us are wired to see the world as a just place, because again, that's how we get through the world. We want to believe that the good are rewarded, the bad are punished. Um, sometimes many of us want to believe in an afterlife where there is justice. Um, and an apology has to, you know, a lot of times, especially with systemic apologies, with systemic injustices, you have to see that the world is not always a just place. And that can be really difficult for people. We want to think, oh, if they died of cancer, it's because they smoked. We want to think, oh, if that particular group is more victimized by the police, they deserve it. Um, and sometimes it requires us to see unfairness in a way that we don't want to see. And when we do that, we can apologize better and we can change the world for the better. We did a, a podcast with uh, Dr. Samantha Hardy and we talked about conflict and the melodrama in conflict where there's always the hero and the villain. And really, it's more of a tragedy. It's, there's lots of a circumstances of events that led to the conflict. So if our listeners might be interested in that. I'm interested in that. I want to listen to that. That sounds great. Oh yeah, she, it's really good. She's she's fantastic, um, and and this is where critical thinking and rational thought is. We are irrational, and this is where it's very hard to see our own biases, like the confirmation bias that's that's going yes. on there, um, and and all these different cognitive biases that go in. Confirmation bi bias just meaning just like we see what we want to see, exactly, and we will. Yeah, and we will reconcile whatever it is we saw. We will change it in our brains to make it fit with the, the way we want to see the world. And it's the narrative. It's the it's how we want to tell that story. And that's that's that melodrama because we see it every day on, on TV and stuff like that. And we want to tell our own drama, but really it, it's more of a tragedy that a relationship is damaged or or something like that. And this is what's what was it, it's fascinating uh, her work. Um, and again, this is where what you were talking about is it's it's a self-protection mechanism that we're doing and it's we're trying to protect our self-image is what you were saying but then there's a role for self-forgiveness isn't there so yes. tell me a little bit more yes. about us you know i'm always wary um again i only want to speak about americans but i feel like we as a culture have this need to be like i had to learn how to forgive myself and sometimes people are a little too quick to say that and do that. But I feel for people who really are wrestling um, in an authentic way and not in a not really dealing with their own culpability way with learning to understand that we all screw up. We all make mistakes and being able to forgive other people and being able to forgive yourself in such a way that you say, I definitely messed this up, but here's how I'm going to move forward, both making amends to other people and ensuring that I don't do this again can be incredibly fulfilling for you. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes people hear that our book is about apology and panic, that it's going to be this, you know, uh, you know, buttload of guilt that just drops on them if they pick up the book. And one thing that we want to make really clear is uh, apologies and forgiveness make you feel really, really good. It's like a, it's almost, it's this endorphin rush of this thing that was weighing on me is lifted. And it's a bit like when you were trying to uh, get out of your cube there and run to the ladies uh, at that time, you know, that person there probably wasn't able to, you know, they kept, they, they were so intent on giving you an apology that they weren't able to forgive themselves, you know, as well. And my insight to that, and this is something I had to receive therapy on as well uh, from something that happened when I was younger, um, was that ability to self-forgive is a part, it's about letting go. Is how do you, how do you let go and, and forgive yourself? And, and sometimes we're, we're holding on to stuff in such a way that if you're really authentic about the apology, it could actually get in the way of your relationship with that person because it, it, it's kind of seen as a barrier now because you're still holding on to that baggage where the other person could have let go. Um, can I tell you a quick story about um, an apology that we loved in the book was um, uh, 
this guy, Chad Michael Morissette, who was um, a designer in Hollywood, um, not famous, uh, got a Facebook message from someone saying, hey, I don't know if you remember me. Um, we went to school together in this little town in Alaska and um, I bullied you terribly. And um, my daughter is doing a project in school about bullying. And she said, dad, did you ever bully anyone? And I remembered you. And I hadn't thought about you in years, but um, I wanted to teach my daughter a better way to be. And so I just wanted to say to you, you know, I'm so sorry for what I did to you when we were kids. And Morissette's response was, you know, he sat with it for a little while. And then he wrote back saying, you know what? I don't remember you because everyone in our little town bullied me. I got thrown into lockers. I got smashed into the bleachers. I had to have a teacher escort me. I was little and I was gay and I was in a little town in Alaska and everyone was horrible to me. I had to have an escort going from class to class so you guys wouldn't kick my ass throughout the hallway. Um, but the fact that you found me and you reached out to me and you said this, you are showing your daughter that you know the cycle can stop and that it's never too late to grow and change. And I forgive you and I thank you wow. for you know, what you did. And um, you know, when people are so quick to say, oh, but you won't be forgiven if you apologize or, oh, at cancel culture, nobody wants to forgive anybody. I think the fact that that apology went viral tells us that that sort of that's reductive and that's wrong, that people do want to be able to make real human connections with other people. And we mentioned or, or referred to Mr. Trump uh, there. I, I might recognize him as a president. Um, and 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 again, here is, is some people would say. Apologies are a weakness or they're trying to just trying to save face. So to tell, tell us about, do we need to save face? It's a human desire to save face. I feel like we can't criticize ourselves for, um, you know, people made fun of Jimmy Carter, our former president, for saying that he sinned in his heart. But I feel like, you know, and I, I was raised Jewish. And in Judaism, the emphasis is not on what's in your heart, but what it is that you say and you do. Because we don't, we can't control feelings. Yeah, that, um, you know, we are so self-protective and we all have, you know, or the sociologist Irving Goffman talked about face, which is what, you know, the what we are invested in showing to the world. I'm strong, I'm capable, um, I'm, you know, pretty, uh, whatever it is that you want to say. Um, that, and apologizing well, means lowering that mask means um you know not as it were saving face that's where we get that expression um uh you know the it's the equivalent is also like hand about having the upper hand in a relationship you have to sort of be willing to extend that hand and um that is extraordinarily difficult so kudos to people who manage to do it and that's what we can learn from Brené Brown, isn't that that power of vulnerability? Yes, yes. Um, that a good apology is about being vulnerable, about letting yourself, you know, putting yourself out there with the possibility that you will be rejected. Um, nobody likes rejection. Um, you know, the medieval philosopher Maimonides said that you have to try to apologize and, you know, I would extrapolate from that, apologize well, not apologize crappily, three times. And then it's as if the sin is transferred to the other person. Um, that all you can do is try. Um, all you can do is be vulnerable. And you may not be forgiven. Um, and that is something that, you know, again, that's an act of bravery to accept that. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. So, so tell us about what we can learn from JFK and apologies. Yeah, I mean, he said after the Bay of Pigs, uh, he said, you know, um, 
I want to be, uh, I'm going to tell you what's happening and I want to be accountable. But I mean, that as, uh, you know, another news thing that recently happened was the, um, there was the Tylenol poisonings case in Chicago in, I think it was 1980, where uh, somebody poisoned a f uh, some bottles of Tylenol on the shelves in Chicago and people died. He was never found. Um, but it's wild to me. I mean, this is still a case that's taught in business schools because the, you know, the CEO of Tyl of Johnson and Johnson of Tylenol was like having daily briefings with the press saying, this is what we're looking at. This is what we're doing. Uh, they removed every bottle from shelves all over the country. They went from some giant market share to zero market share overnight. Um, the great ad man, Jerry Delafemina said that, you know, no one will ever know the name of Tylenol again. And what came out of it was we got childproof packaging. We got, you know, the foil. We got um, the kinds of capsules that couldn't be um, uh, tampered with. We got the the cotton. We got the childproof cap. We got the, the, the plastic on top of the cap. And the company came back bigger than ever. So um, apology is action. An apology is, um, you know, uh, being transparent. And we're not used to transparency from our leaders, from our, uh, you know, politicians, companies, celebrities. It's shocking when we get it. I speak about self uh, celebrities then, okay? Yeah. Uh, and I, I love you talk about this, the latest trends of self lacerating. So is it kind of like a humble brag or something in, in the middle? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, the celebrity chapter was the most fun chapter to write because um, in some ways, celebrities are incredibly low stakes. Uh, and, you know, yes, we have these parasocial relationships with them, but it's just fun to see how, you know, celebrity culture operates. And um you know, there was this incident a few years ago uh, where Ariana Grande uh, was caught licking a donut in the donut case. And, um, you know, she released a statement saying she was really sorry, but she just wanted to call attention to America's obesity e epidemic. And, you know, uh, Jerry Lewis was talking about, you know, uh, when he got called out for saying women aren't funny, uh, he had a whole thing about, you know, I love women. They make babies. They deserve better. You know, I'm so sorry if you misunderstood me. Uh, it's just really funny to parse terrible celebrity apologies and see the gigantic sheer ball of shimmering narcissism that underlies them, you know? We have the different types of apologies uh, there with the, the bingos. There's, there's a lot more actually in the book um, here. And, and what I'd like to, to finish up now on the podcast is, is, is say, for example, somebody is apologizing to me. How do I accept to apologize? Or maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't, you know? Uh, so, so first of all, how do we accept an apology? What are the different phrases I'm so glad that you, you know what, William, nobody has ever asked me about to talk about the accepting an apology chapter the whole time or the, the content, that content, the whole time we've been promoting this book. So thank you for bringing that up is I think that it's important to, to acknowledge if it's, if it is not one of those gaslighting, you know, sorry, you're such a snowflake apologies. If somebody is actually trying to apologize, saying Thank you for that apology. I know that was hard to do. Um, I think that is always a fair thing to say. Um, if you accept the apology, I think it's important not to say, you know, no big or whatever, it's fine. You know, that doesn't acknowledge the other person's bravery and vulnerability. Saying thank you is really important and like, you know, I really appreciate you doing that. I forgive you. Don't think about it. You know, don't even, don't give it another thought. That's great. If, however, a lot of times we accept an apology, but we still feel yucky about it. 
And that is when we can think about why do I not feel good about the fact that I just accepted this apology? And that could be because it doesn't meet those six and a half points that we want an apology to do. And you you are more than entitled to say, well, first of all, you can always say, thank you. I need to think about that for a bit. Um, I really appreciate you doing that. I'm not ready to talk about this yet, but I appreciate you coming to me. Um, that is completely fair. Um, but if it's a bad, if it's a well-meaning but ineffective or uh, ineffective apology or apology that just doesn't resonate with you, you can say thank you. Um, listen, I'm glad you apologized for X, but what I'm really upset about is Y. And can we talk about Y? And I want to talk about it because I value our relationship and I want us to be in a good place after this. And I want to be able to forgive you with a full heart. And hopefully the other person will meet you where you are. And what, what advice would you give it, 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 it to offer us? How do I forgive and let go of anger then? What, like, you know, somebody's there and I, I'm like, I'm really burning. Like, oh, I'm hearing this. And I'm like, oh, I just, even though I've got an apology, I just don't know what to do with it. Well, I mean, there is so much evidence that forgiveness is good for you. Let's put it out there. It's good for your, your blood pressure. It's good for your immune system. However, I always worry that the pressure to forgive um, is not healthy in and of itself, because sometimes it means that, you know, oh, you should forgive because, you know, it's about making other people feel more comfortable. It's about making the workplace feel more comfortable. It's about making the family. Oh, forget, you know, forgive the fact that your father hit you or forgive the fact that this thing happened. That's about making other people more comfortable. And the pressure on you is not about you know, your feelings. It's about make, it's about making other people happy. And that's not good. Um, the, uh, the pressure to forgive often feels like the whole, if you just fight, you know, think about beating that cancer, then you're a loser. If you don't beat the cancer, sometimes, you know, sometimes things are unforgivable. Sometimes cancer is unstoppable. And the pressure to forgive is not helpful, especially if there are things that are unforgivable. Um, but if you can forgive and you think about it as this is a gift I'm giving to me, not a gift that I'm giving to the other person, great. But I also feel like if you can't forgive, that's okay. Especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially when it comes to sort of systemic injustices. I've written about how we have this sort of societal addiction to stories in which a less powerful person forgives a more powerful yeah. person, uh, Holocaust survivors forgiving Nazis, survivors of black church shootings forgiving the shooter. And I think we should examine that about why we like those stories so much because they really reinforce the status quo. And we don't have to forgive stuff that is yeah. unforgivable. And another insight I have on that is, is that you have to remember when you're apologizing, the other person has been wounded. And and then it, like any wound, wound, can it be healed? And if it can, it's going to take time. So I think this thing is, please forgive me, please forgive me. It's a bit like you need to give me time to heal first. And let's talk about it. Beautifully, beautifully said. Yeah, this has been so uh, insightful. The book is so insightful. Uh, nine chapters, really interesting. All the stories here. Marjorie, you've been so, so uh, generous with your time. If people were to find out more about you, how might they do that? <laughs> uh, you can go to sorrywatch.com, which is Susan's and my website. Uh, Susan uh, has actually also written an international, co-written an international best-selling book about animal behavior and her insights on animal behavior really uh, inform this book. Um, and she blogs at a place called The Nature of the Beast. Um, now I feel terrible because she wanted me to tell you what part of Ireland her people came from and I can't find my note, um, but I'll email you afterwards and maybe you can say where she's from. Well, I would suggest she's from Cork because there's lots of McCarthy's in Cork. 
I I will get back to you on that. Um, okay. I feel like either she said she's not from the Cork McCarthy's or that she is from the Cork. Uh, yeah. And then I'm at MarjorieEngel.com. Um, and oh, also I should say that the book is coming out uh, in paperback in January and it's actually getting a new title after we have discovered the interest from folks like you who talk about workplace stuff. It's being called Getting to Sorry, which they liked because it sounded more like Getting to Yes, that famous negotiating book. Um, but uh, we we were surprised. We were all sort of taken aback by the fact that people saw this as a workplace book because we didn't see it that way. But now, of course, we can, that this is something that makes... I think we're also all learning how to be together again after the pandemic. Yeah. So, um, so, so look for getting to sorry as a much cheaper paperback because hardbacks are so expensive. I really enjoy chatting with you today. Me too. This was great. I, again, I so appreciate you having read the book. Most interviewers don't do it. So thank you. And that is the most common feedback I get from every guest on the show. I am so I am so sad to hear that. But again, so grateful to you. <laughs> Marjorie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, William. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Workplace Podcast with your host, William Corliss. Our special thanks to this episode's guest for sharing their expertise with us. If you found this episode valuable, please rate and review it. For updates on future episodes and to get in contact with us about any workplace topics, please follow Yellowwood on LinkedIn and Twitter at Different Paths. As always, you can head over to yellowwood.ie for any other information. Yellowwood, your external learning and development partner, provider of executive coaching, facilitation and training. Take a different path to success with your career, leadership, team and organisation.